Hey, welcome to OD on Life. Uh, as you know, if you've listened before, our goal of each episode is to give you at least one nugget that you can walk away and actually use in your life. So we try to be entertaining and inspiring, but more, more importantly than that, we try to be empowering. So uh, we're not just here to be fun. Hopefully we are fun, but uh, remember that's the goal and get out your pen, your, your paper and be ready to write something down that you can actually use. Uh, we're on iTunes, we're on Stitcher, we're on YouTube. We might be on SoundCloud soon. I'll let you know about that. Um, enough of the intros. Uh, what we have here is a redo and we have David Long here today. He's the president <laughs> and CEO of My Employees and the author of Built to Lead, uh, Seven Management Rewards Principles for Becoming a Top 10% Manager, which reached number 10 on the Wall Street Journal's bestsellers list and number one in the leadership category on Amazon's bestsellers list. And besides all that, he is a very gracious guest. We have had a whole bunch of snafus and technical difficulties, and he's willing to, to give me a redo uh, after we had a great conversation last time. So thank you, David, for that. I appreciate you being here again. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Dan. Excellent. And I honestly, I had a great time talking to you last time. And uh, maybe this one will be even better. I feel like I'm, I know you better. I'm better prepared this time. So uh, anyway, let's give it a go while everything's working. Um, Again, I just uh, told you guys that the book that David has written is called Built to Lead, Seven Management Rewards Principles for Becoming a Top 10% Manager. And I just wanted to give you a chance to, uh, I know everybody's wondering what rewards stands for, including me. Um, you want to give us your, your elevator pitch for the book and why we should buy it? Sure. Rewards is an acronym, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, in the title. Seven Management Rewards Principles for Becoming a Top 10% Manager is a subtitle, if you will. I... Um, Basically, it stands. The first R stands for recon or reconnaissance in uh, the military. You, and basically, that is kind of like uh, Jim Collins says in Good to Great, how you uh, determine who's on your bus and how critical that is. Because if you don't have the right people in your team, you're going to launch off the platform, but you're going to fail and come back down. And you keep doing that. And, and what happens is, if you don't get it right, and you, your best people see that you're doing that over and over. They'll leave. You don't want that. But you right. got to have the right people on the bus, so to speak, as Jim Collins, and I agree with that. The second one is E for education, and it's not your typical go-to-school education. I'm not talking about that. Uh, one thing about college is it teaches you, as someone once said, it teaches you how to learn. Yeah. It doesn't teach you what you really need when you get out in the job. Very small aspect of that is going to help you. Uh, someone said all, do, all college does is prepare you and teach you to learn. Now you're really going to learn what matters. So education, there are two aspects of education that I talk about in the book. One is mastermind, which you and I talked quite extensively yeah. about last time, and that is huge. You know, I'm, I'm a member of three or four different ma mastermind groups. One as high as 25,000, another one 20,000, another one 10,000. I mean, so, you know, and a couple of that I have that I don't pay anything for, you know, because they want me in there. One of them is my own, and yeah. I have six local CEOs. So masterminds are critical, obviously. Napoleon Hill, they can grow rich. Yes. Uh, the second part of the education is my book clubs, which I started a decade ago. And you need to, you know, one of the mantra, if you will, that I have is build yourself, build your team, and together you'll be built to lead. And that's where I got the name for the book. And uh, what you need to do is, is you need to work on yourself all the time. Set the example. I read three to four hours every day. Wow. Didn't start out that way, but uh, started out about a half hour a day but gradually realized, okay, I'm watching a TV program that's giving me absolutely nothing, so why waste my time doing that? Let's read that time. So I yeah. gradually moved a lot of time over of my day into making myself better. In my company today, my employees, myemployees.com, and we're the, in the top 1% of employee engagement and recognition companies in the country, the United States and Canada, which were also there. Uh, but we have, uh, we did, uh, we're projecting 11 million this year, uh, which is, if anybody you know really knows, it's uh, like 0.004% of businesses ever hit 10 million. So that's pretty good. Right. So we're an elite group. But education, I, I work with my team. I pay my employees, and I have 55, 56 employees. I split the company up into two groups in book club. And I actually have roughly 27 or so in Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. And then the next day, Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, we split the company up. Right now, we're doing Dave Ramsey's course, Financial Peace University. And uh, I, I'm, I, I subscribe to the fact that if you make your people better, yeah. the company is going to be better. You know, and when I talk about book club, I only 
we only work on the individual in book club. We don't work on your skill set as it pertains to the company, Dan. Okay. That doesn't, that's not an issue. You know, so, I, I saw, oh, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. I saw something today that I think you might like, and maybe you've seen yeah. it before. I saw just a great one liner and it says animals are trained, people are developed. And oh, that absolutely. really, I like that one. Uh, I like it too. And we talked a lot about it last time about how, you know, some managers might say, well, wait, I'm going to, you know, pay all my people to, you know, 55 people for an hour every week to sit in a book club. I'm going to pay them for that. They should do that on their own time at lunch or, at, you know, on the couch at home or something. But long term, that's going to come back to you with employees that stick around longer, you know, yeah. people learning to have better relationships, less stress at home, better exactly. health, you know, better yeah. sleep habits, whatever it is. So it really does come around. I think taking that long term approach is really smart. Indeed. Let me let me give your 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 uh, listeners a fact that uh, radically changed my life and why they need to pay careful attention when I'm talking about book club because book clubs made me millions of dollars and I'm not exaggerating one iota on that when I say it. And the thing is is that book club has bonded my people like nothing else. We've been doing this for over a decade. And to give you an idea, before I started book club, the salespeople never went to lunch with production people huh. or support people or any of that. And my company back then, we only had about 12 employees uh, a decade ago, and now we have 55. And we're in the, in the business world, which is what is known as a gazelle, which is any company, if your listeners don't know, you know, you know I know you know this, but any company that grows by 20% on top of 20% on top of 20 for five years. Some people say four, but usually it's five. And that's a gazelle. That's continuous, solid growth. That means you got your act together, right? Yeah. So and actually, I, I didn't know what? that term. I like it, though. That's cool. Oh, really? I, I figured you would have known that. Okay, yeah. that's all right. It's and a so great I mean, that's exponential then because you're talking about you're at 100%, and then the year after that, you're at 120%, and then you're gaining 20% on 120%, right? So it's yeah. a bigger yeah. improvement every year. Every year. Every yeah. year. As opposed and, um, to a lot of a lot of markets that tend to do the what the bell curve thing where they start curve. to slow down, right? Absolutely, so you're absolutely the opposite of that. Yeah, and like I said, today we're in the top one percent in our industry, and that's that's no small feat. And it's due to my people. You know, my job today, Dan, I don't work in my company at all. I don't answer the phone. I don't engrave plaques. I don't do employee engagement surveys with our clients. I don't do any of that. Mm -hmm. All I do, I have three aspects of what I do today. I am coach, mentor, and cheerleader without the skirt. That's me. Very nice. And I want to get back to the reading real quick. You said that okay. what it, over a decade, is that what you said? You went from reading yes. a half an hour a day to four hours a day? Uh, That's right. Was there a, a big leap in there where you were doing a half an hour, half an hour, and then you maybe found a role model or something and jumped to several hours? Or what? Or it was pretty gradual over even keel? Yeah, let, let me tell you what I did. I basically, there's a, there's a sales program called Action Selling. And one of the aspects of Action Selling, it says replay the call. And when you, when you go on a sales call, when you get out and you sit in the car or, you know, get off the phone, whatever the case may be, you sit there and you realize, okay, and you analyze, I should say, what Dan and I talked about, what the next step is, what do I need to do, what, where did I feel I went, did an exceptionally good job, where do I believe I, I failed? What I could I have done better? So you're replaying the call. And I took that a step further, Dan. I, I got to where I, I started the process. And I've never heard this from anybody else. But I replay my day. Okay. When I get to the end of my day, I look back and I say, what did I do? Oh, okay, I watched this program. Did I get anything out of that? No, it's worthless. You know, I got my, I got my laughs, my ha-has, you know, by watching that sitcom. Yep. But then... I really didn't enjoy it enough to justify. Did it add any value to my life is the main thing. Bottom line. No. I used to be an avid sports watcher. I used football. Yep, Good gracious. Yep. I love football. College right. and pro. Basketball. I'm North Carolina boy, buddy. I mean, you know, the Tar Heels. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, I, I watch them all the time. Michael so, Jordan's alma mater. Absolutely. And he yep. lives here. I mean, he lived in Wilmington, and that's where he's from. Okay. Where I live. You know, of course, yep, I'm up at my yep. beach house. I'm at my beach house today, so – I'm up at Surf City, North Carolina. But anyway. Very nice. Um, yeah. So that's, what was I saying? Lost my train of thought. Oh, you were talking about what you devote time to and you recap every day. Yeah. Play the day. Replay yeah. the day. So I get to the end of my day and I think about it. So I started thinking, you know what? I watched the Tar Heels play, but did that really impact my life? No, it did not. So I've just about, unless it's the ACC tournament or yeah. if my boys are playing in the NCAA tournament, I'm not watching it. I don't yep. even know the names of the players anymore. Right. 
So you know, I'm not that I use I, my I, time wisely. I totally identify with you on that. I love the game of football and mm -hmm. I used to watch a lot of it and gradually I watched less and less and I'm from near Seattle and of course the Seahawks have been on a yeah. tear the last few years sure. and uh, you know I still like the game of football but if you're trying to keep track of the NFL there's yeah. I think what is it 30 teams or maybe it's more now you've got 30 yeah. teams and now if you're a college fan holy cow we're talking hundreds of teams yeah. and if you're into college basketball as well in the NBA I mean how many, you know, you've got 55 employees, but you're trying to keep track of what, 200 teams or something? And I know guys that they know the standings and they, they'll argue with you about why Ohio State dropped to number three from number two and how it's not fair because, you know, I mean, the Sports <laughs> Writers Association and da, da, da. And it's, I mean, it's cool. They're having fun with it. But man, that energy, uh, that knowledge devoted to another area could be huge. And yeah. actually, you said that uh, you didn't get that idea from somebody else recapping your day. But you know right. who else did that is Benjamin maybe. Franklin. I don't know if oh, you, you know, knew. Maybe I did get that from Benjamin. I mean, I read his autobiography. Th that might have been where you, yeah, maybe, maybe it was in your subconscious. Your system, huh. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, I don't remember exactly how he did it, but he had a system at the end of every day. I think it was like, yeah. what did I do well? What could I have done better? It was very yeah. basic. Yeah. yeah, I actually read his, uh, the uh, autobiography. It's actually, it's a... Uh, I paid it. It was an antique book. I bought it, and the cover was about to fall off. Yeah. And I had a I had a dealer find it for me, and I read that a long time ago. You know, you're probably right. That's a good point. I probably yeah. did get that from him. I listened to that uh, about a year and a half ago when I was on a trip down in the islands in Thailand, and I would ride around on my motorcycle and listen to his autobiography. It was a really awesome. good book. If anybody out there is listening and hasn't checked it out, it's a classic. I highly recommend. Is that uh, an uh, audio audio? Is it an audio book? There is there is an audio. Yeah, huh. and I'm, I'm sure you can audible? get it on Kindle. Uh, I don't remember if it's on Audible. I don't remember where I got it exactly, but oh, I'll check uh, that. And you know, it's so old. You might even be able to get it on YouTube, or it might. There's probably a free version out there too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, good. Yeah. I'll do that. So, yeah, that's for sure. It was basically it's a biography wrapped up in a personal development book. I mean, he goes through all kinds of experiments that he ran in yeah. his own life, and it's a really good one. Uh, I read that one and then, or actually listened to that one and then Thomas Jefferson's biography back to back. And it was really interesting stuff. Wow. I haven't done that one. Yeah. It, I'd recommend it. I think you'd like it. He's a really interesting guy. Um, if I had to pick a favorite founder, it might be him. Mm. Um, and I really like the, the, the Jefferson Memorial in DC too. If you're ever in DC. Oh, I did too. I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's, several times. That's Very an nice. underrated memorial. I think you never. It see is. It. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's beautiful too with the cherry blossom trees there. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, back to the reading, uh, three or four hours a day, I think, yeah. you know, there are some people out there that would make an argument that, you know, they're too busy for that. And, you know, they may be working 10 or 12 hours a day, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, I did, was too. Right. And that's what I was curious about. So, you know, 20 years ago, would you, how would you have felt about reading four hours a day? I wouldn't have been able to do it. Yeah. So you now, worked, I, I, you worked I was working, I was running the company. Yep. I was also still doing sales. I did the accounting right. payroll, which we did it once a week on Friday. So no, I couldn't have run that then. But you okay. know what, if you think about it, I probably could have got pretty close because I was watching a lot of sports on those nights. Yep. Right. Right. You know, and, and whatever TV. Or maybe just, you could have done it weekends or Sundays or something. Absolutely. Like that, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's a habit that, you know, I've been, uh, what was it? It was The One Thing by Gary Keller. I think we talked about that. Mm -hmm. I was just finishing that book the last time we talked. Right. And he talks about how, um, you know, people tend to focus on increasing their discipline. And mm -hmm. in his view, that's the wrong way to go about it. He said, look, so, you know, I didn't look into all the studies, but supposedly they've done yeah. studies on people trying to increase their discipline. And it just isn't that effective for most people. It's not sustainable. Right. So what he, you know, they talk about this concept of habit stacking. Use that limited bit of discipline that you have to build whatever your new habit is, whether it's reading more or eating healthy food or getting up earlier or whatever, and wait until that has become a habit and then shift that discipline to something new. So uh, I think reading more, that's something I'm working on personally right now, and I'm really liking it. Um, I'll throw a tidbit in. I actually uh, wanted to mention at some point anyway, I checked out a podcast. It's called London Real. It's a really good podcast. They had a guy named Ty Lopez on there, and he talked about speed reading. And mm -hmm. it's T-A-I-L-O-P-E-Z, that's his name. And go to YouTube okay. and type in speed reading and his name, you'll find the video. And okay. you know, he reads a book a day. 
that's kind of his uh, his mm-hmm. shtick, you know, and that's the the headline on all the interviews about him. And then people go, right. what, a book a day? That's insane. You know, how can you do that? And he says, here's how I do it. A, the first thing he does is he looks at the cover, then he looks at the inside of the cover for the summary, and then he looks at the table of contents, and he he decides right then, is this all stuff I've already read? Is there anything yeah. in here I actually need to learn? And there might only be two chapters that he wants to read, or it might be one chapter, or he might say, I don't want this book, and just go to the yeah. next one. Sure. And he said the, the quickest hack to be to increasing your, your speed of reading is to skip books. The second mm-hmm. one is to skip chapters, you mm-hmm. know? So I, I think it's school or something. I've had it in, you know, it, it's hard for me to skip a chapter or a half a chapter or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But I've, I've been getting better at it. And I think that getting rid of that idea that you have to read a book cover to cover is it's so liberating or it was for me. Yeah. Just get yeah. what you want, pick out the nuggets and then move on. Yeah. Brian Tracy actually said that years ago. I learned that from him where he just said, if you're not getting something from a book, just get rid of it and get something else. Start reading yeah. it. You know, I, some authors, I just bored to tears. My, yeah. I mean, they just drive me crazy. <laughs> right. Well, it's I the can't same. Deal with that. that might be the same guy, you know, that would bore you to death in person too, or a lecture or whatever. You're not, <laughs> not going to click with everybody. But you know, the difference between having a boring conversation and reading a boring book is the author's not standing there watching you. If you, if you put the book down or go, oh my God, I can't stand That's this. Right. It's nothing That's personal. Right. You know, he's not watching yeah. you. Your teacher yeah. from fourth grade isn't watching you either. So just move yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. And I read, I read for knowledge. I don't, the thing is, is in the beginning, I read for knowledge and I can't really say a lot of the time it was entertaining. Yeah. But now reading, I've, I've done it so long now, reading for knowledge is when I get to the end of each chapter, what's the high point I got out of that? Mm-hmm. And if I couldn't find one, I'm going like, well, you know, that's not good. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. So like you said, I'll skip something if I feel like I've got a pretty good grasp of that. I will skim it. I don't want to say I skip it. Yeah. I will kind of skim it. Speed reading, basically. I, I learned how to do that years ago. Uh, my own philosophy my, of what I do on learning is, is that when I read a book, I highlight it. And immediately after I finish, I go back and reread the right. highlighted portions again. Then I go on my calendar on my phone and I go out a month ahead of time, three months ahead of time, six months ahead of time, and a year. And what I do is I go back and I reread, skim that, those highlighted portions okay, again. Yep, yep. And it reinforces. That's how you learn. Because right. you know as well as I do, you can read a book today and you will only retain 10% of it tomorrow if you don't do something yep. like what I just said. Right. And that's the key is, is repetition is how you learn. That's just it's human nature, but that's what yeah. we are. In that spaced repetition where, you know, there's a, there's a science to that too. I remember watching yeah. a talk. I think it was a TED talk. The guy who uh-huh. uh, invented Atari or you know, was the main guy behind really? the Atari yeah. video games. He was creating a website and I always blank on the name of it, but and I, it probably still exists, but it was an open source type of site where any teacher, or any person could input lessons, um, yeah. you know, so it could be like, I went there to check it out and it was a geography quiz. And it was, mm-hmm. I don't, I didn't know the geography of South America at all. I could name maybe Chile and Brazil and Argentina and that was about it. Right. And uh, I mean, I was surprised once I started taking the quiz. I didn't know even which country Colombia was. And I would have thought that <laughs> I would have assumed I knew that. But anyway, yeah. the thing what it did was it, it asked me, you know, what, what country is this? And it would, it would highlight a country and then it mm-hmm. would do it another way where it would highlight three countries and say, which one is Colombia? And it, so mm-hmm. it, you know, different learning styles and whatever, and it would make it harder and harder. So if I got, if I got Colombia right, when it was a choice out of three highlighted countries, uh-huh. the next time it came around, it might highlight five or six and then uh, it might highlight wow. all of South America. It makes it a little harder every time. And some of them are really obvious. Like, uh, you know, the little tiny country, you know, that's not Brazil. So it's easy if they just highlight those two. But then the right. ones that you do poorly on, it repeats those more often. And with bigger, with bigger ones. Yeah, exactly. So it, it picks you. on you. It picks on your weak spot. And I like that. And then that's this pretty thing, cool. Yeah. And you sign up for this thing and it would actually keep track of when you needed to take that lesson again, which is exactly what you just described. It would automatically huh. do that. And then after so many lessons, it's like, you know, you've kind of got that now. You're, you never need to take that you lesson. Should share that. You should definitely put that where that's a resource people could grab because that's awesome. You know, I'll put that in uh, the notes on this episode. I'll, I'll sure. have to go find it again. But uh, mm-hmm. Atari, I'm writing it down. Atari guy website. Okay. Yeah. I'll Pretty add cool. that link. It I is. like that. I'll use that. Yeah. And I'm just hoping that it catches on and a bunch of teachers jump in and, you know, I'd use that to study the Thai language right now if I could. And mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so we got to the E 
on rewards. What else Education. is in there? Yeah. Uh, the W is Winners Emerge in our book club, and this is where I got with the title, is that when you start educating everybody, some people naturally step forward more than others. Those will be your future leaders. Now, let me tell you how, how much that's impacted. We have one of our, our, actually our most shy, if you will, introverted employee is Josh Straw and his last name. So, I mean, he's a super guy and very, very introverted, though. You know, and he came in anyway, so he was in the book club. And of course, introverts naturally don't want to be shared in front of 25, you know, 28 people. Yep. <laughs> so we, it's, not, it's mandatory with us. We tell them that when we hire them. If you can't handle it, you shouldn't come. Because we're, if you're there, I'm going to make sure you get developed into something you're not today. So what happened was, is occasionally, of course, if I'm in town, I always want to do book club myself for our people for the two days. And uh, then the next thing is that I, if I'm not there, my COO or one of the other managers. But occasionally, Dan, we want to let people step forward if they want to. We want to give them a chance to show us what they can do. So we ask for occasionally of our employees who would like to run book club next week. So I'm on vacation. I just got back from Scotland, by the way. And then I'm, I'm talking to my COO and uh, Adam Tart, my right arm, and he says to me, he said, guess who wants to do book club? And I said, who? And he said, Josh Straw. I said, Josh Straw? Are you serious? And he said, yeah. I said, don't you dare let him do it till I'm there. So I yep. said, okay. So when I got back from vacation, Josh did it. And I remember Dan, he's standing up there and his hands shaking, but he did a great job. Excellent. And I mean to tell you, that kid has come out of his shell phenomenally well. I, I, it's amazing. And you know what, that would not have happened if we had not had book club. So he's, a, he's one example of all the people who have stepped forward. And we have a world-class team. And the vast majority of the reason we have a world-class team in our company is because of book club. And I develop my people. Let me give you another example of book club when I talk about winners emerge. And I don't just mean winners emerge in your company, Dan. Here's what I'm talking about. We read Dale Carnegie's book, or Carnegie, I even say it, yeah. uh, his book. How to win friends and influence people, right? Right. And at the time, this was about a year and a half ago, we only had 30 some employees. So you can see how fast we're growing. And the vast majority of that reason is because of book club. And the, what happened is, is we read Dale Carnegie's book. And uh, at the end of that, I had of, of the 30 some employees we had, four of them either emailed me or called me or said to me personally, Dave, that book saved my marriage. Wow. That's over 10% yeah. of my employees said the book saved their marriage. Now, one of them, I won't say who her name is. I don't want to embarrass her. But uh, she's one of our salespeople. Her and her husband were separated. And she came to me after that was over and she said, Dave, after reading that book, I realized that I am the problem. And today they're back together. They were separated, living apart. Today they're back together and they are happy as they can be. And because she realized that she was being selfish. And I mean, they're doing phenomenally well. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to realize that, but that takes a really big person to admit that too. Absolutely. It does. And yep. that's growth. That's what I want to see. Right. So that's, that's when I say winners emerge, that's what happens. So it's not just within the company, Dan, it's in their personal lives. And that's the main thing. That's what book club is about is building the people. You have another hour or whatever it is that you train them the specifics of their job. But if you build them and they you think about it right now, we're doing Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. It's a bunch of DVDs in their workbook. So we're, it's going to take us probably four months to get through that course. But here's the thing. If you have employees who don't know how to manage money. Oh, and by the way, that's most of them. Yeah. And they learn how to manage their money. Guess what? They stop getting calls from creditors. They stop having those arguments with their spouse. And by the way, 85 percent of marriages break up over money related issues. So if I can help them fix that or get that straight before they even get married, wow, you know, I make my employees better. If you've got creditors calling you, you're stressed out. Do you think you're gonna do a good job for the company? No. And you you're know, gonna that's, you're gonna snip at people if they say something you yep. don't like. And that's a gap too in the education system. Robert Kiyosaki is always talking about that. That's you're their whole mission is to, try that, to, right? to fill that gap. Because Absolutely. you know, I remember in school, learning about supply and demand. I can draw a supply and demand curve. I can talk about yeah. price elasticity and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. basically, okay, that's great. You know, if I'm gonna run a gazelle company like yourself or whatever, those yeah. are concepts that can be useful. But mm -hmm. we skipped straight to that. We never talked about how to balance our checkbook. 
That's right. We never never talked about what percentage of your paycheck when you're an employee, what percentage maybe should I think about setting aside, you know, to to fundamentals. Right. Exactly. Fundamentals. That's exactly right. You know, Um, it's just not there. I mean, if you're not learning it from your parents or if you're not lucky enough to have a mentor, it's just getting skipped. So that is crucial. It is. It helps make you successful because if you, especially today, Dan, when kids are getting out of out of college with, you know, 30, 40, 50 or more thousand, you know, dollars yep. in, in, in debt mm-hmm. and they get out of school and I've got all this massive debt load on them and they can't afford to have their own house or get qualified. They have to stay living with mom and dad. So, I mean, they, these are things they need to know before they do that. You know, right. I, you know, I tell people, you know, and Dave Ramsey says this, look, you know, if you go to community college for the first two years and then transfer to your big school that you want to get into, they don't say on your diploma, your degree, that you weren't there the first two years. That's right. Right? But you save a ton of money by doing the fundamental stuff locally before you go off. Yep. And, you know, I even had friends that did that and they got priority on registering for classes right. and all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, <laughs> yeah. and I remember one of the biggest advantages, my friend went to, did exactly what you just described. And he could park right outside the building and he had like a 30 second walk to class where I, I, you know, I'm from Washington state. I was trudging all the way across like a mile of campus in the (laughs) sideways rain, you know, in the winter and riding my motorcycle up an icy hill because my car was such a piece of junk. I didn't trust it to even get me there. Uh, Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good way to go. You know, Um, I think that, uh, and like you said, you know, there's a ton of education that happens whether or not you ever go to college. And if you do go to college, the education that happens after college, this, you know, just becoming a lifelong learner, regardless of if you're learning on your couch or if you're learning at a university, or if you're on YouTube taking open course classes from MIT or Harvard, which Mm -hmm. is all there. Like I was uh, taking, well, I wasn't enrolled, but I was watching all of the lectures from Tal Ben-Shahar, the guy who did that. They called it Happiness 101. It was Positive Psychology 1504. The first time he did it, I think he had like eight students and then, you know, he had 50 and then it was, you know, standing room only, people out the door. Uh, and that's Harvard. And like you said, people, you know, come out with tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands in, in student loan debt, yeah. or you can watch it on YouTube from your couch. So, <laughs> yes. you <know? laughs> Not that you, you shouldn't go to Harvard, but, but if you can't get in, there's other ways to do it. So don't let that be Absolutely. an excuse. You yep. know, and if you have the opportunity to be able to get the knowledge without the expense, but most people are too short-sighted, they place a zero value on something they pay zero for. Right. And that's a shame because there are resources like you just mentioned out there if you'll just look. Yep. And today we have more than ever. You know, so many things are online now. Yep. You know, I don't really care. I have, a, I have a degree and I have a master's degree. But if you go to my office, you'll have to look in a drawer to find them yeah. because I don't really care about the piece of paper. You know, I actually had a, I got out, I changed, I changed majors and I later went back and got my degree. I dropped out of school for a while, but then I went back and got my degree. And then I said, you know what? I still need more knowledge. And I decided I'd get my master's. Well, I went ahead and got that. But the thing is, once again, the vast majority of the things that they make you take, I don't really care about. Yeah. I've learned so much more on my own independent study, if you will, by far, not even, not even a concept of being close. I mean, it's minuscule compared to what I've, what I've learned on my own. Right. I've heard multiple people say who have been to really prestigious universities that what they really got out of that experience, it wasn't the knowledge, it wasn't the facts and trivia, it was their connections, their fellow sure. students that they met, their professors That's that they're, they're still in touch with, powerful sure. networking, which is awesome. Uh, yeah. But, you know, you can go to the library at Harvard without paying tuition. <laughs> so, wow. That's I mean, good. I mean, you, you, can, people. you can go meet these people even if you don't yeah. get accepted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I want to ask, too, there's a concept Shoot. that I think is really important. I know it helps me out a lot personally, which is when when you look at people that are where you want to be uh, and you, you some people put certain folks up on a pedestal. And they say, wow, that guy must have amazing talent. Or, you know, Dave's got the master's degree. That's probably why he's running this gazelle company. Or, you know, uh, you know, for some reason, they're lucky, they're blessed, they're talented, whatever. But to keep it real, I'm, we talked about this last time. You started your company out of your parents' garage, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, I mean, can you give a little background on when you did that and how it went? Yeah, I started. Uh, I started my company out, of, and I tell I told you before I, I started my company more out of desperation than inspiration. 
Yeah. I didn't have a plan B that I could do. I, I interviewed for jobs and I couldn't find anything that was going to help me pay my bills. And by the way, the reason I started in my parents' garage, and you know this because you and I talk, but the listeners don't, is that I lost my job three and a half years earlier and I went through seven jobs in three and a half years and ultimately lost everything I had, sold my house two weeks before I lost it in foreclosure, mm -hmm. ended up having to move back home with my wife and three children, mind you, with my mom and my dad and my baby brother still lived at home in this 1,340 square foot house. So eight people in there is a bit crowded, buddy. At <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I, I did a, a, an assessment, if you will, of what I knew and what I had done. And I had a little, I had engraving machine, a little pantograph, and uh, that basically, I figured I would run with that and see what I could do. And ultimately, I was successful with it and kept building on it. And, you know, actually, it's funny that you said, well, Dave, you have a master's degree. That's why you're doing so great. Sorry, but in the beginning years, I was doubling the size of the company every year. So yeah. that's better than the 20% or whatever, right? Right, right. So, no, that doesn't have anything to do with it. All. And I love what someone once said. College does not make the man, Dan. It refines the man. Mm -hmm. The man is the man. And that's basically it. You got it in here or you don't. Yep. Hey, I want to ask you too. So you were engraving. What were you doing? Bracelets, trophies, all of the above? I, I was engraving jewelry. I learned how to engrave okay. jewelry when I was in high school and college. Matter of fact, that's what I paid for my school with. Okay. And I had an opportunity to buy an engraving machine. But it wasn't, it's something I did on the side. I did like name badges and that kind of thing. And, you know, and then uh, I ended up doing some plaques for Circuit City when I was working there. That was one of the seven jobs I had. And uh, they loved what I did. And I did the other two Circuit City stores in Charlotte. But that wasn't enough to stop the bleeding. That's when I had to move home. Mm -hmm. So I had no other recourse. But I said, you know what? I sold those plaques to Circuit City. Let me try to sell somebody else. And I did. And I was successful. Okay. And uh, that, that is really, I just never stopped. So how long, how long did you do that for? Did you was that a transition into your next line of work, or how, what happened there? How long I did what for? Uh, how long were you doing the engraving? Oh no, I've always done engraving in the background a little bit. Okay. And I, you know, I Runner's World, they did little pal tags, what they call personal identification tags, because when you're a runner, most people don't have any ID. You get hit by a car, okay, so yeah. you have their name, their phone number, and if they have, it's a red one if they have medical conditions. Right. You know, and uh, but it's, if they don't, it's a yellow one, you know, that kind of thing. I did those. That was one of the things I did as I was struggling and before I had to move home with mom and dad. So, yeah, it was just, it was a distraction. I wasn't really making any money doing it. But uh, and there is no money. I love when people say so I was in the jewelry business for years, too. And, and, and there's someone once said, and I agree with them, you know, the jewelry business and the banking business, there's lots of money and lots of value there. but They don't pay their people. There's no money in it mm -hmm. unless you're the owners of the right. bank or the drug store, you know, but that's it. So, I mean, that's what you, you constantly, constantly work on yourself and learning new things. I mean, I went out and tried, I failed in the engraving the very first time, failed. Had to come back and say, okay, they don't want that. So what do people want? So I looked at what other companies were buying like Circuit City and developed what I was gonna sell based on what other people were already buying. And so you know, were you- trying to reinvent the wheel till you know what the wheel yeah, is. Right, right. <laughs> And when did you first get into a management position? Was it with the engraving business or was it something else? No, it was in, it was in retail. Okay. Yeah. Matter of fact, I was very successful in retail. I was chosen one of seven managers out of over 1,200 on the East Coast for the district manager interviews. And, uh, you know, that's in top 1%. So, I mean, I was very successful. And uh, that's when I lost my job. I broke a company policy okay. that I disagreed with. And the only reason they knew that is because they came to audit me for those district manager interviews. Okay. And uh, so, <laughs> and they asked me a question and I, I told them that I just, they, they said, are there any policies that you disagree with? Because they were about to put me over 40 stores, Dan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, yeah, there is one. And they, I remember the regional security guy, Paul was his name. And he said, which one? And I told him, I said, I don't agree with the split and commission thing. He said, well, have you ever broken it? And I had a moment where I, you know, uh oh, Better lie, you know, and then I just said, no, I, yeah, I have. And yeah. he said, oh, he said, oh, Dave, that's the, that's, this is the hardest phone call I've ever had to make in 22 years with the company. I said, why? He says, this is a big deal. I'm going, what do you mean it's a big deal? He said, here we were thinking about putting you over stores, but, you know, I got to call and check with the, re, the uh, divisional vice president of the company. So he calls the guy, puts him on the phone with me, and the guy, he, he starts cussing at me. And uh, his name was Joe, and he said, uh, he said, David, you're one of my blankety blank superstars. What are the blankety blank you think you're doing? 
And I said, I, I don't really agree, agree with the policy. Nobody gives a blanky blank what you think about the policy. It's the policy. You know, he said, and he, and he just said, you screwed up, son. Of course, he just said something else. But he said, hand the phone back to, uh, to Paul. So I hand it back to him. And I hear Paul saying, uh, are you sure, sir? He's one of our best. And I'm like, what does that mean? You know, so he gets off the phone. And he says, give me your keys. Hmm. My keys. Wow. You know, and I'm like, you're kidding me. I said, I was expecting this little slap on the yeah. wrist, you know. And uh, no, they made an example out of me and they ended up firing uh, eight other guys in three states doing the same thing. Whoa. All senior, all senior managers. Let me tell you about that thinking and what it cost them. That, that electronics chain uh, was Radio Shack and look at them today. Yeah. And now those yeah. other managers, was it the same policy? They didn't? Uh, all was it senior managers. They thought it was stupid too. Wow. When you have that many people doing the same thing, wouldn't you think you need to look at that? I w that's exactly what I was thinking. But they yeah, didn't. Exactly. And what, okay, the commission was being split between who and who? Or what was well, basically, basically the this, this situation was, if you came in and worked with me, um, and I was working with you, let's say I was a part-timer, and you didn't have your, page, you didn't have your uh, checkbook, and you wanted to come back the next day, and um, the policy was, if, if, I, if, if whoever wrote you up gets a sale, and I don't, I didn't really think that was right because I had two trainees that were in each other's necks, man. I mean, they were just, you know, one, I had the number one and number two trainees in the district out of uh, almost 40 stores. And uh, man, you know, I, they were always arguing because they were so competitive. And uh, I thought it was the right thing to do. I just, you know, if I actually paid too much, if I, if I found out about the situation, when I did payroll, I adjusted it on the next weeks. And, uh, you know, part of the problem was then it looked like I was paying more money than was just mm -hmm. than was due, even though I was going to take it off the next pay period. And I so, did that for a while and it was so I'm, fine. I'm curious here. It, I mean, yeah. it reminds me of my brief stint in retail. So yeah, you had somebody talking to this customer for an hour and a half about why they should yeah. buy this particular piece of equipment. And they say, oh, you know what? Okay. I get paid tomorrow. I'll be back. Then they buy yeah. it from the other salesman, right? And yeah. so you would give the first guy a portion of the commission. You'd, you'd split it out the way that you thought was fair. Is that what? Correct. What you, okay. Yes. And uh, I mean, somebody had to do all the paperwork and everything else. So, you know, it's hard to say, well, Dave, I put in an hour with the guy and you took 15 minutes. I need, I need, you know, 80%, whatever, yeah. you know, but you, it was the way that worked out better for everybody. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, is they didn't really like that because it, it could screw the county. Like I said, I didn't find out about it. Until because the person wasn't there when we did payroll the next day, he came in and said, hey, so-and-so bought. How come I didn't get credit for that? So I would adjust it on the next pay period, which was two weeks later. Yeah. And okay. so I would take some from the first, give it to the second. So once in a while, I would pay the individual, and I'd already paid the first guy. So I would wait to take it out of the next pay period. And they knew that I was going to do that. Yeah. But there again, I could understand the company's perspective. What if that guy quit and sure. I paid him too much money? And then I ended up paying extra money to my other guy who was still there. So, I, you know, I'm not totally faulting that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it, it was it was their policy and I broke it. Yeah. Because I didn't think it was right. But you got to keep your people happy, man. I mean, yeah, well, out, that's your first you know, line of defense. What if what if a bunch of them quit because they're not happy? You know, yeah, it seems like you said, I think yeah. it's I mean, it's big of you to say, yeah, it's the policy and I broke it and take responsibility. Yeah. But if you've got eight managers doing that, it seems like there probably needs to be a discussion about yeah. that. Yeah, I uh, agree. And you know, for that to happen on the phone sounds a little strange too. If you're one of the top performers, it seems, I mean, maybe they were very far away or very busy people, Texas. but it seems yeah. like a sit down, you know, at least like let's meet at Denny's on that one, right? Well, there's a regional security guy was the one who was there in my, in my, in my store, mm -hmm. you know, and he, he was the guy, he was over nine states. He was a regional security guy for nine states. Very successful. Okay. He'd been with the company, like I said, 22 years. So. Uh, super nice guy. He liked me a lot. That's why he said this is the hardest phone call I've had to make in 22 years. Yeah. Because he was oh, so, based in Charlotte and I was close by in Rock Hill. So he was in person with you calling the other guy, his manager. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. His yep. boss. Yep. Got it. Got it. Okay. And then that so guy I dropped the ax from afar. Ouch. Of course. Yeah. And it was, but you know what? Here's the thing is that things are either someone said things are either the blessing in your life or they're a trial. And things, you know, they, they things like that make you better or bitter, either one. Yeah. So I learned from that, and uh, you know, and I will say that uh, it was a it was a blessing to me because today I would I would be a company guy still, and Radio Shack is almost in the toilet today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if I'd put my whole life, and here I am, fifty seven years old, 
uh, you know, please don't think that I, I mean I'm bragging when I say this, but I'm a multimillionaire. I have three homes. I don't know a dime on any of them. I have a 20,000 square foot office building with 16 acres of commercial property. Don't know a dime on it. Even though we're getting ready to build another 13,000 square foot building, I probably will finance for a couple of years and pay it off. Uh, but I, I have Harley Davidson motorcycles. My wife and I both, we rode a motion to ocean in 05, cool. six and a half week trip. You know, I, I, I'm able to do things today that if I would have stayed with Radio Shack, I would not have the money and the means that I have today and the freedom, if you will, and yeah. the success. And speaking know. of freedom, because I think what you're describing, it's sort of the opposite of what a lot of people envision, you know, a busy CEO with 55 employees who must work 80 hour weeks and he's, you know, overweight no. and stressed out and chugging coffee yeah. all day, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how many, I mean, what is your work day? You read three or four hours, you're coaching people, you're dropping in on your company. What does it look like? Yeah. I'm actually only in my office, in my company. I'm really, I'm very seldom ever actually in my office. I might be there five minutes a week, just so you know. Uh, I go into the office for several things and that's it. The rest of the time I'm working from my house and my home office. Uh, I go in Monday morning. We have our managers meetings from nine to, and then we go to lunch, you know, kind of deal. We go from nine, nine to 11.30 and we take off for lunch. I spend another hour and a half, I, I pay for them, obviously. We always go out and we, we, we talk. If we need to continue talking about something work related, we will. But most of the time we just goof off and we go to lunch and we're talking about things. But it is critical. Most of the time we do talk about some things that relate to work, obviously. So we continue that conversation while they're there. And then secondly, I come in for book clubs if I'm in town. Mm -hmm. So that's an hour and an hour on Wednesday and Thursday. So I am in my office less, I'm actually physically in the company less than seven hours a week because I have highly competent people working for me. Yep. And you know, my COO, Adam Tart, is my right arm. He's been with me 17, almost 18 years. Uh, he is the COO. He takes care of the day-to-day -day stuff. I have on my computer here, I have five um, you know, dashboards. <laughs> and when I'm on vacation, I pop on here every day and see what's going on. And so I'm, I'm in constant contact with my people. Don't think I'm ignoring that. One of the things in my book I talk about is I have find five a day. And I look at who's doing what and I reach out. If it's possible to do it on the phone, I'll do it on the phone. I'll text or I'll send an email, whichever. And I say, hey, Dan, I noticed you did this amount of money in sales today. Tell me what you, tell me what you sold to get that. Okay. Because I want them, I, I give them an opportunity to brag. And that's the second R, right? That's recognition. Is that right? Or yeah, is, it's part of it. Sure. Okay. Sure. I, that wasn't quite right. I can tell by your yeah. face. Uh, yeah. So rec recognition, I want to ask you, um, you know, you hear different rules of thumb uh, as far as criticism to recognition and, and encouragement. What's the, what's a healthy ratio? And is it is it up to individual man manager style or is, is there something that's kind of across the board? No, there's a good ratio uh, that you really need to uh, the, the recognition amount that, that is optimum, if you will. And this is by Gallup and World at Work and a oh, great day, a whole bunch of different surveys. George Mason University did research on it as well, is that you need to be people basically want to be recognized for something every seven to 10 days. Mm -hmm. And if you go over seven to 10 days, they feel like they don't matter. Now, let me give you how bad it really is out there. According to Gallup, they said that 65% of employees surveyed said that they had received no recognition from their manager in the last year. I got a military helicopter flying by out here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm on the beach. I'm at the beach. So the military goes back and forth sometimes. Um, anyway, um, but that's the case. It's their recognition is not being done. And there's right. two reasons why managers won't do it. Number one is they're insecure. Yep. They don't want somebody making it feel like they're, you know, too good because then guess what? They come and they say, I want more money. Mm -hmm. I'm doing so great, Dan. Why aren't you giving me more money? Right. right. So they don't want to have it. So they ignore it all together. They're very, very, uh, let's just say they fall, they fall pathetically low on the scale of what they should be doing, which is your number one thing that you do as a manager is build your people. Remember it, Zig Ziglar said it. He said, you don't build your company, Dan. He said, you build your people and your people build the company. Right. It's known as leverage. You know, I use the analogy, uh, you know, in my book, I talk about it, is that if you've got a car and you have four tires, which you do, one of them goes flat. What do you have to do, Dan? You pull over to the side of the road. Yep, take it all off. Of, and... The other, All of them are sitting there. Yep. 
So it's so critical that you have competent, strong leaders in all departments. So let's just say each of those four tires are managers and they, rec they, they represent the people in your company. Of my 55, 56, whatever employees, we're adding a few more here coming up in the beginning of uh, June. Of those people, I have five managers. So roughly for every 10, 11, 12 people, there's a manager. And uh, any one of those that drops the ball, everyone suffers. So you have to have those competent people. And that's what I said early in the beginning of the interview. If you're constantly taking off and coming back down because you've got the wrong people, you're going to lose the best people. Yeah. You know, Gallup said 47% of your top employees are looking to leave you right now. Why? Mm -hmm. Two reasons. They don't feel like you care about them. You're not recognizing them. And they're not going to work with losers. You tolerate losers. They figure you're a loser, Dan. You know, you I want have you can't assess who's a good employee. That's why you keep this incompetent moron working here. I'm glad you brought that up too, because something that we touched on last time that I wanted to ask you about is uh, I brought up a couple examples. I don't remember exactly what they were, but you were really uh, you bluntly said like that's a deal breaker with us. That doesn't happen at our company. Mm -hmm. um, what are the the lines that you cannot let people cross as a manager? I think that's a tough subject for people. Um, and you know, yeah. firing firing is commonly what most managers report is like the hardest part of their job, of right? So sure. So how do you handle yeah. that? A deal breaker for me is managers. Yeah. All my managers have to be like I am, constantly learning. Okay. And I will say, guys, let's read this book. You know, you got two weeks to read it. Half hour a day, easy. So you know, I want them to spend a minimum of a half hour a day. My managers actually spend more than that. And uh, the thing is, is that we had a manager about a year ago that uh, we had to replace because when we're in our manager's meetings and we're talking about something that we all read, this individual really had nothing to say. Sometimes he would try to fake it. Yeah. And it was so obvious. So it reminds me of high school. <laughs> exactly. So I, I yeah. remember talking to this individual and I, I, I had sent him an email about it. You know, come on, you know, you need to get your act in gear. And then when I, I copied in my COO, and my CEO writes back, he said, I just want you to know, I had the conversation with him a couple of weeks for the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. And he has not improved. And I said, mm, okay. So I pulled him into my office. I said, you've got to do this. You understand? Yes. Well, then the NCAA, speaking of basketball, the NCAA tournament comes on. He's in his office and he turns his monitor so you can't see it. Mm -hmm. And when you walk in his office, all of a sudden he's, trying to get on his computer, you know, get, click, 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 you know, get off that. Right, right. So, and then I just basically, I, you know, on my time, he's watching basketball. You know, yep. He loved, yeah. he loved Kentucky, you know, the Wildcats. So he wanted to watch that. So the problem yeah. is I wouldn't pay him to do that. And, and you and, gave him uh, plenty of warning. He'd been warned oh, yes. by more than yes. once by more than one person. So oh, that's, yeah. that's over, not months, over months of time. Yep. And that's, so that's not like the guy at Radio Shack who got the phone call and decided to fire you on the spot over the phone. Right. I mean that. No. Yeah. Definitely not. No, I, you think about it, Dan, you have in this particular individual, he was with me seven years. How many hundreds of thousands of dollars that I have invested in him? Right. That's why you always try to salvage. You know, I tell people and I train my people this, you hire, you train, you prune and repeat. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got somebody in there and you start investing all this money in them, but you realize they have weaknesses and they're not fixing them, like they don't want to read or they have a bad attitude about having to read. You know, believe it or not, I've had people that even though I'm paying them to be in the room, they didn't feel like that they should take a half hour of their time a week to read a chapter. Right. So I had this one girl who started bad mouthing me at our Christmas party of all places. So she was bad mouthing me about book club to the wife of one of my other employees. And uh, the wife told my, my employee and my employee told me, I said, what'd they say? She told me, I said, oh, good gracious. So I called the individual and I said, I, you know, I'm getting secondhand uh, information that you're not happy about book club. And she, you know, vehemently defended herself and, you know, denied it and all this, but her, her actions were obvious Yeah, and we already knew it. Hey, let me ask you on the flip side, have, and I don't know how your hiring process works and exactly okay. where you, you source leads on that from, but yeah. have you ever had people come to you because they go, oh my gosh, I want to work somewhere that has this book club? Has that happened? Absolutely, it has. I would to think so. You, to give you proof of that, over three quarters, almost four fifths 
of our employees, our current employees are there because other employees told them how much they love the job. If your people will go, I'm going to prove what I just said. If your people and yourself, if you go to myemployees.com forward slash sales, you will see a video of Jennifer on the right hand side of the screen. And Jennifer was telling me how much she loved it. She tells me all the time how much I love this job. You've given me the opportunity to radically change my life. And she kept saying that over and over again. And I've heard it from others. And I started thinking, you know what? Why would I not put that video, <laughs> yeah. capture that, what she says to me on our hiring page for sales? Yeah. So I have on the left hand side, I have me describing the job and on the right hand side, I have my employees, my salespeople talking about how much they love the job. Yeah, man, that's, that's, boy, that's so much more powerful than me saying it. I would think as a manager in your company, if somebody comes to you because a, they know they're friends with a great employee of yours, you know, the yeah. birds of a feather flock together type of thing. Sure. And they're excited about something like your book club. What, what a great indicator that that person's going to be long-term a great hire, right? Absolutely. It's get the out. same. And I'll get, I'll get shameless with my plug here. It reminded me though, when you were describing that of um, the better me game, which we've talked about and probably most yes. of the listeners have, have heard of it. I, but if you haven't, I made a personal development board game called better me, the game of growth and friendship. Yeah. It's at bettermegame.com. Anyway, one of the things that I didn't really anticipate about the game, but one of my favorite things about it is every time I host the game, uh, I meet at least one or two people that it's it's like this automatic filter. I put it out there on Facebook or on you know meetup.com or Craigslist or whatever it is. The people who are attracted to play a game like that are really awesome people. I've met some really great friends through that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just like a cheat code to life, you know, instead of yeah. going to a bar or to watch the game and, you know, hoping to meet some interesting people, I just say, hey, who wants to come play a personal development board game? And they yeah. just, it's like a magnet. And I, I could yeah. totally see your book club doing that same thing, yeah. just bringing you amazing lifelong learners for employees. So cool. That's great. Oh. And, and not only that, what I did, and I mentioned this in my book, anyone that wants to come to book club, we invite you to come. Because oh. you get to see, you get to see my employees not only their faces, but how they buy into it and how we have the interaction between us. You know, we all share about our lives and we're all just so tightly, you know, fitted together because we care about each other so much, you know, and we know that if you're a production employee and you drop the ball, that you're affecting the lives of all the other people in that room. Or if you're a salesperson who doesn't pay attention and is doing the wrong thing, maybe you, you put the wrong information in the account or you weren't paying attention. So, you know, the other people have the wrong information. It makes them look bad. It hurts them in front of the prospect or the client in this case. You know, so all of that, they, we know how each thing that we do affects each other. Yeah. So we, you know, attitude is huge. And that's, by the way, that rewards the A is for attitude. Okay. Now, I'll say this right. We won't, I don't need to go on attitude a whole lot. But let me just say this one thing that my father used to say. My dad used to say, son, your attitude is like a piece of glass that you put up in front of your face. And as you look through it, if it's clear, everything you see through it is clear. But if you take it and you drop it in the mud and you pick it up, everything you see through it is cloudy and dirty. Right? Yep. So it's critical that you have a great attitude because if you don't, you will get snippy with other employees or worse with your clients and that you cannot tolerate. Yeah, we do not. You know, and occasionally, you know, we've had to pull people in and say, hey, you know, what's going on in your personal life? Why are you all of a sudden having a bad attitude? And most people, Dan, you know, they know we care about them, so they'll listen to you. Now, if they don't think you care about them, they're going to take it as mm -hmm you know, personal assault. Basically. It's defensive. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So if you come at from the attitude of, Hey, I'm just Dan, you know, you're not usually like this. What's going on. I'm trying to be understanding here, but I'm getting some complaints from other employees. And what I'm telling you actually happened years ago, we had our top salesperson and she was getting married, but she started biting the heads off people in the office. Wait, several, somebody that was a lady that was about to get married, had a bad attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, sometimes and that's what, and that, yeah, well, it's not, that's what it's, it, <laughs> the thing is, is that, is that she, um, you know, and we thought maybe it's the stress of getting married, all the details and all that kind right. of stuff. But right. I had one of my managers pull her aside in a nice way and say, Hey, we're getting some complaints and 
Is it because you're getting married, you're getting stressed out? Oh, she freaked out. And she goes down the hallway to the other, one of the other corners of the building to my COO's office. And she blasted him, man, pinned his ears back. Mm -hmm. You know, just wow, went off. And I remember um, when, when my management took, my COO and this other manager had called me and said, this person is a problem. I said, all right, take her aside. I'm the one that said, what's going on? You know, people are, they ask her this, tell her, say, yeah, we see there's a problem here. We just want you to know that, be aware of it. Let's see what we can do to take care of that. But that's when they talked about, you know, are you getting married? Is that stressing you out? That's what freaked her out. So she goes down and she blasts my CO. And when he came back, he told, they told me, they got on the phone with me. I was in vacation in California at Redwood territory. And I remember they called me and said, Dave, um, she freaked out. And I said, okay, let her go. They said, I remember my COO saying, Adam said to me, he said, Dave, she's our top salesperson. I said, I don't care. We'll get more money. We're mm -hmm. going to lose good people by having to tolerate an individual like that around. And I'm not going to do that. So we let her go. I mean, it floored her. Of course, she's apologetic. and everything. No, if you didn't want to get your attitude straight for the right reasons, you you may yeah. say you'll straighten up, but you'll be right back in a month. Yeah. Oh, and yes. so did you, did you ever find out what was, what was going on? Like, no. So there was a sudden shift and it's a mystery. Yeah. She probably mm -hmm. needed to be on meds or something. I don't know. Could be. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was a bad situation. And you know, I, over years and years, she basically begged and begged for her to come back. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we don't allow people to come back in the building if, if other people are uncomfortable. And I remember when we let her go, some of our employees came forward and said, oh, I'm so glad you got rid of them. They never said anything. Right. That always happens. That yep. always happens. If you're tolerating someone like that, they're making other people's lives impossible. To, yeah. You know, to you have know, a I, good time at work. I come from real estate and it's the same yeah. thing when you're a landlord. You learn that you've got to get rid of the bad tenants, even Absolutely. if they're paying, even if they're not behind yeah. on the rent, you got to get yeah. rid of them because they'll drive all the nice people away. They'll make it hard to sure. rent out the units, you know, and then like yeah. you said, after they're gone, people come up and oh my gosh, thank you. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I want to, before I forget, you said people could drop in on your book clubs and that's, sure. that's open to who? Everybody? Anybody. Wow. Anybody. And wh where do these take? I got nothing to hide. You know, yeah. I've, 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 I practice what I preach, man. <laughs> right. That's great. I could see some of our listeners taking you up on this. So where do they happen? Like what cities are they in? Well, we, it's in Wilmington. It's in Wilmington, okay. North Carolina. Yep. That's where our office is. Great. And uh, we don't do them everywhere else. That's what you're talking about. No, we don't okay. do that. But okay. they're, they're in our offices. If anybody is in traveling in North Carolina or wants to come, we're on the ocean, you know, Wilmington. And uh, so more than happy, just contact me. Let me know you want to come. We'll make it happen. Great. That sounds really cool. I hope somebody yeah. listening will take you up on that. Hope it we too. have somebody in your neck of the woods. If I'm over, over there, I'd love to check it out. That sounds Come great. on. Yeah. We'll play some better <laughs> me and I'll go to your book club and all that. That's right. Absolutely. You know, um, I had a few other questions I want to not forget to uh, okay. address. Um, so I'm wondering, you were talking about, you know, your people know that you care about them and that makes it easier right. to communicate and everything. I think yeah. um, some people, like you, you mentioned that they have a fear of, you know, too much, uh, too many compliments, too much encouragement could lead to the, you know, I want more money or whatever. Uh, yeah. I think there's also that, um, the fear that some people have of getting too buddy buddy with employees in case you know there ever is a tough situation like you just mentioned or you know like in the military how the there's the officers dining hall is separate from the sure. enlisted guys what do you think about that what's the appropriate balance i think in and my once once in a great while i have an employee test me on what you just said they try to take advantage of the situation that i have mm -hmm. a great relationship with my people but i don't allow them to do that mm -hmm. i just don't you know i had a guy uh, one of our one of our salespeople recently, who was having a phenomenal month, is he decided he would uh, kind of try to take advantage of me on the situation. And I remember, you know, he was goofing off, and I told him, I said, "All right, if you're not going to be doing what you're supposed to be doing, because he was doing so good, he kind of thought like, well, you know." And I'm, I do give him extra kudos, you know, allow him, you know, take off with your with your girlfriend, go do something. Here's a hundred dollars, go take her out for a nice dinner, you know, whatever. I do stuff like that. But if he got where he was kind of just goofing off and wasn't doing what he was supposed to do on the job, he started goofing off. And then I told him, I said, if you're going to goof off, regardless of the, you're such a great salesperson, but if you're not going to do what you're supposed to be doing, other salespeople will see you doing that yeah. and they'll do the same. I'm not mm -hmm. going to tolerate that. So he decided he was going to do it while I was on vacation. And I heard about it. I told his manager, send him home a week without pay. Oh, my goodness. Suddenly he's interested in doing the right thing. 
But I said, uh-uh, nope, can't do it. You're not getting paid for that week either. And you're also not going to get the renewals, which is something I do with my salespeople. Any renewals that happen during that week, you're forfeiting them. I want you to realize that you're going to goof off and ask for things or take it upon yourself to set policy because you will be more of a detriment than a help. And I'm not having that than an so, asset. So it, have sound, that. it sounds like you have that, that toughness and that you're able to be assertive regardless yeah. if you have that buddy, buddy attitude. So it's yeah. not about avoiding the buddy, buddy feeling. It's knowing oh. where to draw the line when you need to. sounds oh. like they know that I take very, very good care of them and I praise them. Yep. And I put in, if you want to call it, I put a lot of capital yep. in the good side, you know, of all the praises and everything I'm given the recognition. But I, because I have that in the, in the, in the bank, so to speak, the emotional yep. capital, I can go over and kick them in the shins because they know I love them and yeah. I care about them. And if I, just like that woman that, that I told you we had to let go, our top salesperson, you know, she knew we cared about her, but she basically just freaked out and I wasn't going to tolerate that. So yeah. we made an example of her, right. but this guy, he straightened up after that. Oh yeah. Big time. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you have to do that. Um, I, I have another question to ask you too, that yeah. I think um, a lot of people struggle with. If you're going through a tough time um, in some businesses, it might be, oh my gosh, are we going to make payroll this week? Or, yeah. you know, in, in a smaller business, it might be your first virtual assistant that you're, you're um, I might have to cut this person's hours back or whatever yeah. it is. Um, at, how much do you share as far as challenges that you're facing as a company? And mm -hmm. when do you share it? Or do you try to carry the, carry the burden and shelter the people from that? No, I think the lines of communication, people have more empathy when you're open with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll use this as an example. My very first employee, uh, Robbie Worrell, when he was with me, you know, 20 some years ago. And um, I was really struggling. I mean, we had been in business for really less than a year. Actually, no, when we moved there, it was in a year and a half, a year and a half. So um, Robbie was there. And I remember I had trashed my credit. Remember I told you I'd move back home with mom and dad? Yeah. So vendors didn't want, they, I had to pay COD for everything. Mm -hmm. So I had a plaque order coming in and I had to go and, uh, you know, I don't have it on today, but my jewelry, two rings and a bracelet. I hopped them so that I could pay for the plaques in cash. Yep. But two other times, actually two times I did plaques and two times I had to do that to make payroll, to pay him. Yep. So if I had to do that, means I didn't have any money, right? Yeah. If I had to hop my jewelry, yep. I didn't have the money. But I made sure that he knew, Robbie, I'm going to make sure you get paid. I'm going to hawk my jewelry. And I gave him the money. And I remember Rob saying one time, the second time, I think he was shocked the first time. But the second time he was, I really hate that you have to do that, Dave. I said, well, I'll get paid. I'll get money. I got Circuit City was my biggest account. And sometimes they just drag their feet yeah. a little bit. But I, the money would come in and I would be fine. It, it might have been a week later or two weeks or whatever. But I wanted to make sure he was taken care of. And I wanted him to know that I was sacrificing for him to be paid. That builds loyalty yeah. between you and your employees. Right. Now, if you're going through a tough time, you tell them. The lines of communication should always be open. And here's what I say. Let's go to the other side of that, too. Every employee that comes to work with me, Dan, I tell them, Dan, I will pay you what you are worth to me. If you want more money, don't come to me in a year's time and say, I've been here a year and need a raise. Anybody who does that, you're pretty much off my radar. Yeah. How have Man, you increased your value, value, right? Right. I say, all right, if you want to make more money, become more valuable to the company. Right. If you can do one thing and you've been here 10 years and this other guy or girl comes in and they've been there a year, but they can do five things. Hey, that person is probably going to pass you. Yes, I've mm -hmm. given you some you know, uh, time on uh, time served, if you will, you know, raises because I want to help my people. I want all my people making good money and they do. I pay everybody more than I need to and they know it. That's another thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, they give me more because they know I am giving them more. And I tell people all the time, don't go to the fireplace and say, give me heat and then I'll give you wood. Doesn't work that way. Right. You know, don't go to the field and say, give me crops and then I'll get around and giving you some seeds. Yep. It comes from you as the leader first. So you have to invest in your lives. You have to show loyalty to your people that you care about them before they will care about you, especially millennials. Why? Because they're so stinking jaded. They're so used to having uh, a trophy for nothing, a trophy yeah. for showing up. So they're very, very, they're also very, um, 
oh, what can I say? Calloused, if you will, based on what they've seen happen to their mom and dad and, mm -hmm. and their jobs. And, you know, they lost their job after being in the company so long. Mom and, you know, granddad worked at the same job 40 years, got a watch. That doesn't happen anymore. The average person, this is probably five or six or longer years old, but the average person today has seven careers. You know, that's not going to happen. You know, it's, I bet it's even more than that with people like me who had a lot yeah, know, right. uh, on the way up. So, uh, but that's the case. You know, you have to, once again, you have to invest in your people. You have to let them know you care. And that's how you're going to be successful. And, and like I said, the millennials are very, very, they're very suspicious of people, of managers, because right. they're not planning on being there but a couple of years. Yep. Have you that had takes you into the next thing. What? Have you had some of those millennials come in and then sort of see the light and figure out that you weren't just uh, all talk, you know, that are now loyal and planning on being around? Over half of our employees are millennials. Wow. Yeah, let me tell you something. I don't care how old they are, the individuals in my company, they all want one thing. They all want to be shown that they are significant and that they matter. And that, according to Gallup organization, says they want to know that you are concerned about their development. Hello, book club, yep. right? I mean, that's what right. we're talking about. You know, yes, we train them how to do their job better, but book club is all about making them better. And that's why we cover both bases. And, you know, I've seen some other things about uh, misperceptions of what, uh, what managers think employees want. And, you know, of right. course, they think they want money. It's all about salary. And, of course, that is a, it's a consideration, but it's not the primary motivation. So another one they talked about was autonomy. How much autonomy yeah. do you give your people? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we give them a lot of autonomy. You know, we taste, tell them basically, we don't micromanage anybody. You know, and, and how do you get around micromanaging people? You have people that want to do the job and are doing it. You know, all you do is tweak. That's not micromanaging. Micromanaging is standing over somebody or monitoring everything they do yeah. all day long. You know, we don't do that, but here we kind of do, but we don't. Here's how we do it. We can tell exactly how many calls our salespeople made over a time period. Mm -hmm. You know, and if it's if it's one day, no big deal. We're not going to say anything. But if it's a habit, oh, yeah, we're going to yeah. say something because they're shooting themselves in the foot. They're wasting. Think about it. If you're paying benefits like we are, like health insurance and vacations, all that kind of stuff, and you got an employee who's doing half as much as the next one, which one's making you money? Right. This one. Yep. This one's just taking a spot. I want another superstar to come in and be up here. And so now I'm curious, you're seeing that, do you have a computer system that shows you how many phone calls people are making or is it people? Yeah, okay, so it's not just trusting a written log. Uh, there's yeah. a saying I like about keeping honest people honest. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm, always, I'm always thinking through what I'm gonna say on topics like this because my assistant who is awesome, she edits all these things. So I have to yeah. like, wait, okay, she's gonna hear this. How do I, how do I put this? Okay, yeah. so. The, my equivalent to what you have is, and right now I just have one, well, it's not an employee, it's a, it's a contractor uh, through Odesk, which is a site where you can hire people to do just about yep. anything. Um, and she is in Croatia, I'm in Thailand. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, that accountability is there because Odesk actually takes screenshots at sort of random intervals about every 10 minutes, but it's not exactly, it's not exactly every 10 minutes so that people don't just close Facebook every 10 minutes, wait for the screenshot and then keep, keep doing their thing. Uh, oh, I like that, that's pretty cool. It, oh, it's, it's awesome. If you ever need, yeah. you know, a, a virtual um, worker, it's a great way to go. It shows you the rate of mouse movement and keypad, like, you know, keyboard activity wow. uh, on a scale of one to 10. So yeah. it's, they're super accountable. And I, you know, I don't look at it every day, but it is there. So it keeps honest people honest. And it's really, sure. it's, it's cool to see. And with a different contractor I had in the past, I saw Facebook pop up a couple times in the, uh, in the little screenshots. And we do a lot of marketing on Facebook. So it's, it's not a big deal, but I enlarge the image to see, you know, is it our Facebook page or our Facebook Personal group? Stuff. Yeah, but no, it was his friends and, you know, he's in the Philippines and it's like pictures of his friend's birthday party and stuff. <laughs> and, yeah. and it, you know, he worked for maybe eight hours and there were maybe three screenshots of Facebook, which honestly is probably a lot better than a lot of workers out there. Yeah, but uh, it was like what you said where, you know, it was the first time and I, I said, hey, you know, I see this going on. Um, you know, we can't have that. Obviously, I'm paying you. It's fine if you want to take a break and get on Facebook, but you need to pause yeah. your, you know, you pause your whatever you call it, the clock, basically, so that right, I'm, not, right. I'm not paying for you. Go ahead and take a break whenever you want. I don't even care what hours you work. And then it mm -hmm. happened again. And, you know, it was just 
pretty clear that it, it wasn't going anywhere and I, we ended that relationship. But sure. um, anyway, keeping honest people honest and having accountability, I think is, is a great preventative measure. Right, uh, I agree. Because That's if the good. risk, you know, did you ever hear about that Stanford uh, experiment they did? I can't remember the guy's name, but a psychology professor set up a fake prison at Stanford. Have you heard of that? No. Uh -uh. Oh, it's super interesting. I, anybody out there listening that hasn't heard of it, go check it out. It's on YouTube. There's short documentaries about it. He sets up this fake prison and he puts an ad in some paper, I think it was. Students wanted, you know, to do this experiment, blah, blah, blah. They came in, they screened them all to make sure that they were very stable, no history of mental illness or any violent crime or any, any you know, they were all like the most vanilla, well-rounded people they could find. And then they made half of them into prisoners and half of them into guards. And I think they were, I might be getting some of the details wrong. I think they were going to run it for a, a week or something, uh, you know, and they gave them uniforms and everything. And they gave them real power to put people in, you know, isolate them in solitary or, or make them line up and, you know, do an attendance and all that kind of stuff. And it lasted just a couple of days because these guards started going nuts and like physically and verbally abusing these prisoners. And this wow. is not, this is not a real prison. These guys did not actually commit a crime to be there and they saw the same behavior. So even wow. if you've got great employees, if you have no oversight and no accountability, you're just asking for a problem. I mean, you're That's tempting right. people to screw off and get on Facebook and, you know, play video games, watch NCAA final four, whatever it is. So, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> set up. Yeah, set up that's, what the, that, that's also what the, the dashboards are good about because I can see exactly how many sample plaques our, our salespeople are sending out, how many calls they've done, the amount of time they're on the phone, how many hours they actually worked, said they worked, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, they're clocked in, if you will, whatever. Uh, you know, but I mean, you have to be, but you also, you're one of 10 or 12 people. You see exactly what your numbers are compared to everybody else's, and we let everybody see what everybody's numbers are. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So there's peer pressure. And I tell people now, my salespeople are pretty much straight commission, but it didn't used to be that case. But uh, but we typically, just about every other employee in the company is what I call, you know, roughly two thirds of their pay is, is base and one third is at risk. In other okay. words, commission, bonus, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So to give you an example, the power of that, you know, I'm getting ready to on the 24th, which is what, less than two weeks away. Mm, yep. uh, my wife and I are taking 32 people. Uh, we take our top third of our employees every year and their spouses if they're married. Uh, we're, this year we're going to St. St. Martin down the Caribbean. Nice, yeah. All, all expenses paid by my wife and I. And uh, we wine them and dine them for a week. And they're paid while they're there and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we take care of all the expenses. I paid for 20. Some of us learn how to scuba dive, cool. stuff like that. So we have a blast. Yeah. And uh, all of my managers are going too. That's now, excellent. Yeah. Now, if my whole management team and my top people in the company can be gone for a week, how can I make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing back in at the business, right? The company. Right. Because I've, I've incentivized it. If they goof off, they shoot themselves in the foot. That's how you do it. Yep. Right? If they got to hit certain numbers to get a certain amount of extra money. So go ahead, goof off. It's going to cost you. In yeah. the meantime, you can fall behind the other people who were on vacation. Right. I, I, I'm a big believer in incentives, too. And I come from, you know, originally the real estate world where it's all commission. And it's it not even just all commission. It's all commission and you have expenses like your license and your office yeah. space. You know, Remax does not just even give you a place to sit. You know, you're paying a couple hundred bucks a month for, for your, your, sure. for your four feet of counter space <laughs> and a chair, <laughs> a squeaky That's chair. Right. You know, <laughs> I mean, cool. really, it's going towards advertisement and stuff like that and keeping sure. the heat on. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's producer or, or you're gone. You're not in the business yeah. anymore. So but yeah. those incentives, when they're aligned, you know, not there's not a big you don't have to worry about a group of people hanging out at the water cooler all day. You know, they're like, get out, of you know, go ruin somebody else's career like Brian Tracy. Exactly. Says, you know, yeah. I used to yeah. put a, a thing on my door that said, do not disturb. I would tape it on the door, a little paper sign, because we had glass doors you could see through. And I, I would have preferred that they would be solid doors, but I would close the door, it would say, do not disturb. And people that I was friendly with, other realtors, 
would see that and knock anyway because they thought, oh, that just means, you know, do not disturb if you're not his friend, right? So ah, they, yeah. they'd knock and I'd look like literally with the phone on my face, I would look at him like, what, you know, is, you the, building, <laughs> is the building on fire? Why are you not? <laughs> Seriously. And, and they would kind of do like a, like a little, like, do you have one second, one second? You know, I'm like, yeah, no, I, I would point at the sign and I would point at the phone. I'm like, yeah. what you know get out of here i'll talk to you at lunch or whatever but uh mm -hmm. that's because of incentives because you know i mean if i was getting paid by the hour and nobody was looking then maybe i would have said yeah come on in let's talk about the game right right yeah so um boy let's see what am i not asking i wrote down so many questions to ask you and we always <laughs> that, oh you know here's one i did not want to miss because you you'd okay, mentioned it brief, briefly last time i asked you uh about mentors and who have yeah. you had that was a mentor? And you brought up your dad. Yeah, and dad. you talked about, um, I'll, I'll let you tell most of the story, but you talked about an establishment, I think it was down by the boardwalk that was kind of a blight in your town. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. and what he did about that. And then the crazy, it sounds like a Hollywood movie scenario that came out of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. basically, yeah. What you're talking about is, my, of course my dad was a Baptist pastor for 55 years. He passed away two years ago. But what you're talking about is a story I shared with you uh, at the boardwalk down at Carolina Beach, North Carolina. Uh, when we first moved there in 73, they had a porno theater on the boardwalk. In other words, where families walk by. Yeah. Now they put like stars over various parts of female anatomy or whatever, you know, uh, so you couldn't see it. But I mean, it was, it was still bad. So anyway, uh, my father kind of took it upon himself and there were other people in, in the area that didn't like it either. So my dad kind of rallied this, the troops, if you will, and they went about getting that off the boardwalk. So, you know, they, they pressured the landlord and all this kind of stuff that owned the, the uh, real estate. And finally, before it was all said and done, they got him out. They got him off the boardwalk. So he, all the families didn't have to see him when they yep. went down to ride the rides and eat donuts or whatever, you know, kind of thing, or ice cream. So um, anyway, what happened is the guy, because he knew my dad was the head honcho on it, and I was off at college when this happened, but this is what happened. The police pulled the owner of the porno theater over, and in his trunk was dynamite and a couple of guns. And when they interrogated the guy, he said that he was on his way to blow up my mom and dad's house. That was his alibi, right? Oh, yeah. No, don't worry. I was just so he told them what he was going to do. During, so, yeah, during oh interrogation. He didn't say it right in the beginning, but he said it. So why do you oh have dynamite? Gosh. You know, why do you why do you need dynamite? So ultimately, you know, they put they knew about my dad. It's a small town. Yeah, so yeah. They said, does this have anything to do with uh you know, you losing your lease and, and, you know, the porno theater. And one thing led to another, and he finally confessed that he was going to go kill my family. Wow. Yeah. How so old I, were you at that time? I was, uh, I was 18. I was way wow. wow. Actually 19, I think, 19. But uh, what happened is, is that when you said that you talk about mentors, that my father was the type of individual, he walked his talk. And most people don't. So, mm -hmm. I, yeah, my father was by far... Uh, my number one mentor, my mother was my second, you know, because she was the same and still is. She still lives. But uh, I mean, they're, they're, the character is just, that's what matters most. You know, I just talked about that today. I was out in the swimming pool here with a friend. Actually, it's Nick, the guy that was helping us figure out the microphone oh, yeah. thing. Uh, yep. We were talking about exactly that today. Uh, you know, you said your parents, they walked their talk. You know, talk is cheap. And in my personal experience, I mean, I'm not actually writing down the numbers, but mm -hmm. I feel like 75% of the people that I come across randomly, you know, just like when I was running the flea market, different vendors that came and went, customers, whatever, people I've come across in different businesses, I'd say the majority and maybe roughly 75% of people just don't consistently keep their word. Yeah. And oh, maybe, yeah. I'm, maybe I'm just unlucky. Maybe it's half of people. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about that? How many... I mean, just what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, basically, I, I believe that the greatest ability is dependability and, and, and character and integrity and all tie into that. Uh, and my the way, I, the way I treat people is that I trust people, Dan, until they give me a reason not to. Mm -hmm. And if you are the type of person, and this is one of the things that my dad did to me, he did to the kids when we were growing up, is my dad had, I think he had a little bit of a detective in him or something, mm -hmm. but uh, my dad would say, uh, he would ask you, so where, where, you, where were you last night, son? And I, I'd tell him whatever. And so my dad would go, 
are you sure you want to stick with that story, son? You know, and I'm a, you know, like, what's he know? What's he know? You know, because if I, if I wasn't telling the truth or I, I told a partial truth, you know, kind of deal. And I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be, like at the boardwalk or something, you know, kind of deal. Yeah. Uh, so he would always, he would always like, he was like, are you really, you really want to stick with that story, son? Are you sure? You sure? You know, he do stuff like yeah. that. So like pressure, you, you got You know, he's like, what does he know? You know, sometimes you crack under the, you so crack under he, the pressure. <laughs> was he sometimes bluffing or did he only do that when oh, he knew that you were like? No, lying? no, he sometimes bluffed. Yeah, oh. He, he could have played, he would have been a good poker player. I'll yeah. Tell you. But I mean, yeah, he, he was good. But so I, I do that with my employees. Yeah. If someone, if I, matter of fact, this is, I give you a perfect example, a young guy named Brian. This is a few months back. This kid was on fire, ambitious, was reading and doing all kinds of things. Well, he kept saying, you know, I want to progress and all that. And we love that. But then what happened was, is one of my people, his manager contacted me. He says, I think we got a problem with Brian. I'm going, what? What happened? He goes, well, I think he's been changing a few things to make his numbers look better. I said, oh, you got to be kidding me. I said, all right, so what I want you to do is I want you to call a meeting of all the RCs when you have your next meeting, which was an hour or so later. So it wasn't a special meeting regular meeting so during that time he says i just want you to know so we found some irregularities and some things that look fraudulent in one of the rcs in on your databases where you're trying to fudge numbers so we're very specific about what the problem was and then what we want to do is when we when we adjourn the meeting once you go back to your office you got 15 minutes to send us an email and say i was doing that i was doing something wrong 45 minutes later nothing happened so they decided to go on and log in where we can see exactly what you're doing on your computer because, I mean, it's on our network. Mm -hmm. So they logged into this guy, and he's changing stuff back the way it should be. So I said, uh, all right. They said, what do you want to do, Dave? I said, I gave him a chance to come clean, and he didn't. And um, – I said, bring him in and fire him. They said, oh, fire him. I said, wow, he's doing this right and this right and this right. I said, no. So when we sorry, tell somebody to know something. Just, just to ahead. clarify, Dave. So you gave him a chance to either admit it or not. And right. he, I'm picking up that he probably didn't know you had the capability to watch what he was doing. Right. Uh, but instead he decided, instead of coming clean, and maybe he didn't yeah. know what the result of that would have been. Is that yeah. right? He didn't know yeah. what was going to happen if he admitted it. But instead he decided to try to cover his tracks. Right, right. Okay. So, yeah, they, they brought him in, and they did basically like I've taught my managers to do, like my dad did me. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, Brian, you want to come clean on something? No. Nope. Are you sure, Brian? You sure? You know, you give him that look like you know. Yeah. You know, you sure you want to stay with that story? Because if you come clean, we're more – and my people know this, and I've told them many times – if you are doing something you're not supposed to be doing and you're confronted about it, if you come clean, more often than not, we will let, we'll work out something. So this is now his second chance to come clean, right? Yes. Okay. Second chance. And he didn't say it. So I said, uh, I said, turn around the monitor and show him what he had done. And uh, then, of course, he starts crying. Mm -hmm. And because I said, let him go. And, uh, of course, he's, he's crying. He's called back. He's probably called back five different times, talk to different people, trying to, in the management team, trying to get his job back. Uh, but no, no. Because yeah. I gave him the opportunity to come clean. And if a person will do that habitually, yeah. they don't, they're not going to have a key to a multi-million dollar company where they can go in and steal stuff. Yeah. If they'll lie from you, they'll steal from you, right? Yep. Not going to happen. I just had a thought come and go, dang it. Okay. Lying, so, stealing, money. What was it? Man, I was just kidding. I didn't have a thought. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know what? Uh, I'm learning on the job here, man. Uh, that's why we started late today. That's probably why some people are going to be watching this archived instead of live. But yeah. this is, uh, this, this podcasting thing is really fun. This technology is new with the first live one here. I've got my two windows. I've got my, uh, my podcast uh, notes on the right, and I've got the, the screen where I can see you on the left trying to remember everything and take advantage of all the cool <laughs> tangents we end up on. It's interesting. Yeah. I'm a big yeah, believer in, in just jumping in, though. If you want to learn to swim, jump in the pool. Absolutely. Um, we talked last time. Oh, you know, I know what it was. Um, 
somebody who I've never met in person, but I consider a mentor is a guy named Jason Calacanis. He runs a show called This Week in Startups. When I started PositiveAtmosphere.com, I called into his show and there's this segment called Ask Jason. He sold a company, um, what did he call it? It was He's a journalist by trade originally and he wrote about the New York tech scene. Uh, it was quite a while ago. I don't know exactly when he sold his company, but he sold it for $20 million. He tells this story about sitting there on his uh, bank page, hitting refresh, refresh, refresh to look at his ba bank balance. And yeah. it went from, you know, whatever it was, a, a, you know, a typical like working guy amount of money to the next time he hit refresh, it said that amount plus 20 million, you know? Wow. So, and he says he broke down crying and he told his wife, you know what? I did it. I did it. I did it. Today is the day. I knew it. I worked my butt off and today's the day. I, I saw the day coming and it's today. You know, I just, the, the guy is so passionate. Yeah. Uh, anyway. And he, and, he, and he kept crying too because the government took half of that. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That was the next day. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, 10 million is not too bad. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so he, um, Anyway, he talks about this a lot because he interviews founders of companies and they talk about their struggles, tough situations. And a lot of companies, not just employees of companies, but companies screw up. You know, they do something stupid. You know, people's, they accidentally, they get hacked and pri people's private information gets out or, or yeah. whatever, you know. Um, Airbnb all at one time. Yep. Yeah. Airbnb is a famous company now. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Dave. But, sure. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, their first few cases of somebody checking in and trashing somebody's house, you know, it happens. But, yeah. and everybody was, oh my God, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? It's like that worst case scenario finally happened. And he said, yeah. you know what? Everybody makes mistakes, bad things happen, but the difference comes down to, can you A, admit it, you know, and B, make it right. And you know, how, it. Yes. yes. However much it's in your power to make it right. So if you're AB, Airbnb, and you know somebody trashes somebody's house or whatever you know go fix it make yeah. it right and uh, and move on and that's what this guy you're talking about he had a chance to a admit hey i'm human yeah. i made a mistake yeah. and and how can i make it right but instead he tried to cover his tracks and now you can never trust that guy especially when yeah. he does it twice he gave him two chances to come clean that's so right. I mean, I think that's important. You know, not everybody out there listening maybe has a bunch of employees. They may still be an employee themselves. Yeah. And to hear that coming from your perspective, you gave a guy two chances and you just want him to make it right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's that's a it. fundamental to me that, you know, speaking of mentors, that's something I've learned from him is just admit it and make it right. And, you know, that's actually a card in the Better Me game. Uh, <laughs> it says more or less, it says, can you admit when you're wrong? You know, do you always need to be at right? or can you just admit it? Yep. And it's actually the only card that has ever caused a player in the game I was involved in anyway, to, there was this long awkward silence after she read this card, this lady who I had huh. just met 10 minutes earlier, she stared at the card in her hand, there was a very long awkward silence and I was about to tell her, you know you can pass if you want or you can think about it and answer that later, but I just, yeah. it looked like she was about to share so I just shut up. And then she stood up and just walked away from the game and never came back. And I have no wow. idea. What. So talk about it. I don't know what her particular issue is with that topic, but I know that's something I really need to work on is I'll say something stupid and, and then yeah. just like instinctively go, oh, well, I meant to say this. And here's why that yeah. kind of made sense that I was confused yeah. for a second. It's not my fault, you know. <laughs> Type A's, uh, I'm a type A, obviously, and so, um, you know, it's, it's, sometimes you, I like the old saying, you know, open, open mouth, insert foot, close promptly. Yeah. You know, that's, I've had moments like that. I have to right. apologize. There's yeah. probably not, there's probably not a week goes by and I don't have to apologize to somebody, right? Yep, yep. You're making uh, waves. Some people are not going to like it slapped upside the head by the wave. Yep, <laughs> yep. Uh, you know, my dad, great guy, and I don't think he watches this show, so I'm going to share a story, but... <laughs> I was at my dad's house. I was probably in high school or maybe just out of high school and college or something. And my good friend, Zach was over and we were just chit chatting in the kitchen. You know, my dad was making food or something and he, he overhears what we're talking about. And I said, how's it going, Zach, basically? And he says, oh man, I'm really tired today. I didn't get any sleep last night. I'm like, oh, why, you know, what's the deal? And he said, oh, there's these birds that made a hole in the, in the wall of my house. And they're building, <laughs> nice. they're building a nest in the nest. wall of my bedroom. And so I hear this scratching around and chirping and sticks and whatever, 
You know, and my dad kind of looked at him and he goes, well, you know, it's probably mice. And that seems reasonable, right? Oh yeah, it probably is mice. Usually it's mice, right? And so my friend Zach, he looks at him and he goes, yeah, yeah, you know, but uh, I can actually see him because it's right next to my window and I, I watch the birds go in the hole and then I hear all the chirping and everything. Wow. And my dad just kind of nodded his head and looked at him thoughtfully and said, it's mice. <laughs> it's mice. <laughs> what the heck? How do you argue with that logic? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we had a squirrel doing the same thing at our house. Uh huh. Yeah. It'll, my my mom had raccoons uh, mating under her bedroom in the crawl space. That was wild. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, yeah. Just admit it. It's okay. You know, you don't yeah. always have to be right. That's right. <laughs> I'm working on that myself. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, before I forget too, Dave, and I know we've been talking for a little while here. Yeah. Um, so where can people find out more about uh, your book? W where's the best place to go pick that up? Uh, Amazon, of course, probably, you know, amazon.com. It's Built yep. to Lead, uh, Seven Management Rewards Principles for Becoming a Top 10% Manager by David Long. And they can reach me at David Long at top10manager.com. And 10 is one zero, not T-E-N. So okay. top10manager.com. And uh, David Long at top10manager.com anyway. So that's uh, that's where you can reach me. The company number is 1-800-489-0230, and they can reach me as well. But I, I respond to all emails when people send them to me, so I'm always willing to, to answer a question or whatever if they'd like. No, I'm right. happy to do it. But I will say this, anybody that goes to Amazon and buys the hardback copy of my book, if they send me an email, like I said, at David Long at top10manager.com, I'll send them the Kindle version, which sells for 10 bucks on Amazon. I'll send that to them for free. Great. And by the way, I'm also going to send them the $8 uh, workbook that I sell on the book's website. Excellent. And you know, if, I want them to read it. That's why I wrote the cockeyed book. I want them to read the thing. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And everything I said earlier about skipping chapters doesn't apply to Dave's book. <laughs> cover to cover. Yeah. And, and yeah, hey, definitely, definitely in every chapter, there's something to learn in mind. I apologize. I promise you. That's yeah, for sure. Cool. And, um, you know, I know this helps. I'm going to give uh, Dave a little help here too. If you guys get the book and you feel like you've gotten value from the book and from the talk that we're doing right now, um, give them a review on Amazon because that's really crucial to helping a book rise up in, in visibility. And uh, of course, when people see it, if they see a bunch of good reviews, that helps itself. So, uh, you know, Dave's given you guys a bunch of value here tonight. And uh, so do him a favor and take, you know, 60 seconds to write a little review and tell us what you think <laughs> about the book. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of good reviews there now. So if you good. read the reviews, you will buy the book. That's for good. sure. Yes. Um, it's that social proof, right? Right. Absolutely. Just, just like your employee. Five stars, by the way. Five stars. Oh, on oh great. Yes. Nice. 40, 46 reviews and it's five stars. Excellent. Good. So let's let's get it up to at least 50 here with this. Uh, with this <laughs> That's show. Right. So get there and, and write your review uh, and get the free Kindle. That's very generous. Thank you. That's right. Um, and is there anything else you want to cover, Dave? I feel like, you know, we're, we've been talking for a while, but I don't want to skip anything you wanted to get to. No. Uh, you know, we did, we got through about two thirds of the, of the principles, my rewards right. principles. Right. And they're, they're all, they're all in each of the principles is really going to impact your life and your career in like, you, you know, you said exponential before in exponential ways. I mean, it's really powerful if you put them all together instead of yeah. trying to pick and choose. Right. If you know, I've had so many people that have contacted me and that have started their book clubs and they cannot believe the power of the book club. And on the other hand, I have people say, well, Dave doesn't understand the retail world. You're talking to a guy who worked in retail 13 years. Yes, I do. Yeah. You know, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You can do what you want to do. Quit saying I can't do it and right. start thinking, how am I going to do it? This has got to be yep. done. How am I going to make it happen and yep. do it? And that's how successful people become successful. Yeah. It's, you know, Tony Robbins always talks about the quality of your life is directly a result of the quality of the questions you ask. Absolutely. You know, so don't ask why it's hard or why isn't the other guy doing it. It's how can I make this happen? Absolutely. You know, we're, we're wired to answer questions. So ask the right yeah. questions. It's, it's That's super right. important. Um, I want to give a couple tips. I tried to, you know, like I said earlier, the goal of the show is to give somebody, a, you know, every person listening a takeaway. I think most everybody should have more than one takeaway already, but, um, <laughs> 
there are a couple of things I just wanted to mention. We talked about Ty Lopez. I'll, I'll mention that again, the speed reading techniques, um, T-A-I Lopez. Uh, go to YouTube, type in Ty Lopez speed reading, and you'll see it, it's about a 10-minute talk about how he does it, how he reads a book a day. I found it really helpful, and it really freed me up to, uh, to read books in a quick way and just get what I want. It didn't feel like a burden anymore. It felt like fun to pick up a book and pick what I wanted to read about. Uh, and one, two other little things. There are apps that I never knew about until recently that will dim your screen automatically after sunset so that you're not getting that bright light in your face that keeps you up at night where you can't fall asleep. Uh, there's one called Flux, which is F dot L-U-X, so F period L-U-X. Uh, you can put it on your laptop, and it, it's really cool. Right around sunset, my screen dims, so you're starting to kind of, you know, all those chemicals and stuff that you want to start secreting at nighttime, you're doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're not staring at the ceiling. And there's another one called Twilight that I have on my Android phone. So both of those are, have been really cool. Um, little hack for me. And one more, and then I'll shut up, is uh, the dry erase pens that I have in my bathroom right now. I pulled a card the last time I played Better Me, and it said, you know, it you could earn a point for committing to writing down your goals daily for at least 21 days. So I've been doing that. I, I'm already past the 21 days. I'm still doing it. It, it worked. It made it a habit. But uh, I used to do it on a dry erase board that I had up against the wall. And, and it was okay. But what I'm doing now, because I happen to have tile walls in the bathroom that are basically white, is I keep a dry erase pen in there. And I'm writing all over my bathroom wall every day. And I've probably got it written 50 times up there now, the same two goals over and over and over. Uh, it started out that I was writing them on the mirror, which probably all of you guys listening have a mirror somewhere in your house. That's a great place to write down your goals. Um, and if you're lucky like me and you have tile all over the place, that's another good spot to do it. Uh, also, you can use a pencil if, and write it on drywall, white paint. It'll come off later when you move so you don't lose your deposit or whatever. So, you know, keeping those goals visible and writing them every day. They say that was another Brian Tracy thing. You mentioned him earlier, Dave. Uh, you know, having your goals in your head is one thing and seeing them is another. But they say something magical happens when it's going from your brain to your hand. You know, right, right. exactly. Yeah. And I know you have goals and, uh, and are a believer in that as well. So, Absolutely. Okay, guys, uh, we're pretty much there. So again, make sure you check out uh, Dave's book. And again, it's called Built to Lead, Seven Management Rewards Principles for Becoming a Top 10% Manager. That's on Amazon. Leave him a review as well, and he'll give you the free Kindle version. Send him an email. Uh, also, go to bettermegame.com, and you can play the game 100% for free. There's no catch. You don't even have to enter your email. You can just play the game. So go check it out, bettermegame.com. And Dave, I really appreciate you giving me the redo. And <laughs> I'm over, over the moon that it worked. <laughs> all right, Dan. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. All, right. all the Enjoy best to you. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Take care.